You're asking what is duck fin bowling? Yeah, you would like to know what is the duck fin bowling. Um, I would love to know what is duck pin bowling. Duck pin bowling? Duck pin bowling? I know absolutely nothing about duck pin bowling. I don't, uh, I don't know how to say it in, in English. I think duck pin bowling is the bowling with those little baby balls. Do you think that it's a game that requires more than one person? Like it's a, like a team sport? Maybe or it a requires a, a duck. A duck, a pin. And bowling? Yeah. <laughs> I have no effing clue what duck pin bowling is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what duck pin bowling is. <laughs> I'd love to play it, yeah. Perseverance, that's what it takes to bowl duck pins. Everything is smaller and nothing comes easy. Duck pin bowling is the greatest game in the world. We have an awful lot of fun. Once you bowl duck pin, you don't want to bowl anything else. I've been bowling for 20 years. I love it. Exciting, it's challenging, and it's fun. It's frustrating and exhilarating all in the same, all in the same sentence. It's like the Mount Everest of the bowling scene. Everest, perhaps. But you don't need to go to the Himalayas to find duck pins. The game thrives along the northern extension of Interstate 95, through parts of New England, and pretty much the whole state of Maryland. And the game hasn't changed in almost 50 years. The lanes, the pin setting machinery, the traditions. It's found its own little nook in space and time, immune to modernization. There's more than meets the eye when it comes to bowling. It's a regional thing. And few are aware of bowling's brilliant permutations. Duck pins is a three ball sport. We bowl three balls in each frame, 10 frames. The bowling balls we use um, are bigger than a softball. They can be no heavier than three pounds, 12 ounces. In big ball bowling, they range from six pounds up to 16 pounds. duck pins and average 120. You can go right to big pins and average 200, okay? You take your 200 bowler in the game of big pins, there's no way he's gonna come and bowl this game and average 120. This is the type of game where you could throw 12 perfect balls in the pocket and you may only throw seven strikes. Some days you don't have a good night when you bowl duck pins, because it seems like they can turn on you and like life can turn on you. It, it's like golf. You know, the, the lip out, or the, the bump and the wiggle that doesn't fall. And it fell for your opponent, you know, it's like, oh, why me? It's, it's tough to, to get someone to love the game because it's so difficult, but I think that's the best part about it. The game is tough, but amidst the emotions, the passion, the sacrifice, there are rewards. But like all good things in life, you have to earn them. Mm -hmm. 
In the beginning, people threw things to protect themselves. But as time passed and civilization grew, we learned to throw for recreation and competition. All nations develop ball games. But the ball game that surpasses all is an old English sport called bowls. Today, we call it bowling. Bowling is a primeval sport. Its concepts are pretty simple. You throw a ball, you knock down sticks. But duck pins are a somewhat more thorny adaptation of this practice. And the game's fragmented and elusive past is just as complex. In 1903, John McGraw and Wilbert Robinson, two Baltimore Oriole baseball players, owned the diamond bowling lanes on Howard Street in Baltimore. McGraw and Robinson theorized that true skill and the greatest challenge could best be attained in bowling by using a ball designed to fit the hand and using pins to conform to the size of the ball. This was done, and as a group of spectators witnessed the first match of this new bowling game, the remark was heard that the flying pins looked like a flock of ducks in flock. And the new game had a new name. Duck pin bowling. Don't know where it came from, don't know why. I don't really see any correlation other than the shape of the pin versus the shape of a duck. Um, and that's about that on that. But back in 1899, the Baltimore Sun thought otherwise. They established an article on McGraw and Robinson, who were Chesapeake duck hunters themselves. They remarked that the funny little pins looked like bunches of plovers flying off a marsh. Duck pins, you know how they fly. They would fly, my goodness, they would come out of there and fly clear up halfway up the alley sometimes. And although Baltimore has long been dubbed birthplace of the flying duck pins, there actually is no concrete evidence to back this up. And I don't know if it's documented anywhere when it originated. We thought that uh, McGraw and Robinson just cut down some of their broken ten pins and started using a smaller ball. But apparently the game is a little bit older than that. But somebody recently has found references to duck pins in a newspaper from, I think, Lowell, Massachusetts. So I don't really know how it originated. That someone is sports writer Howard Rosenberg, whose baseball research for his book Cap Anson 3 led him to John McGraw and Wilbur Robinson's early duck pin exploits. Rosenberg has been Baltimore's sports history gadfly, unearthing articles in Massachusetts's Lowell Sun-Times from 1894 and Connecticut's New Haven Register in 1896. Both reference duck pin bowling, and both predate the Baltimore Sun's 1899 article on the Diamond Bowling Alley, thereby discrediting the tale of Charm City and Chesapeake Plovers. But Baltimore has enjoyed the spotlight for over a century, and McGraw and Robinson, who made quite a name for themselves outside the National League, have found a place in Maryland history with their waterfall witticism. Uh, good for them. Um, basically, if I was out shooting jackrabbits in the desert, and I found out that if I could kill a jackrabbit, it'd fly up in the air, look like pins, make a game out of it, two thumbs up to them. What would the, so, what would the game be called? Uh, screaming rabbits in the desert. So, <laughs> have you ever shot a rabbit? No. It screams like a human. So. Okay. <laughs> We will never know for certain where and how duck pin bowling began. But one cannot refute its indelible ties with baseball. Born and raised in Baltimore, Babe Ruth was an avid duck pinner. 
Well, we all know that from watching the films and the documentaries about the babe that he was around her and he enjoyed his cigar and enjoyed a beer and, uh, and, and bowling was a man's sport back when it started. Back in those days, a lady wasn't considered to be uh, welcome in a bowling establishment. In fact, they might have been prohibited from even going into the establishment. Well, a lot of your bowling alleys back then were kind of dingy. Uh, a lot of smoke. You had, uh, you know, like spittoons in there. You know, cigars and a smoky place and dark and a little bit of gambling going on. Back in those days, uh, it was the, the shirt and tie sort of game, okay? They took the game that serious that they were willing to dress up, okay? Having, that was their dress code back then, okay? Um, I used to be a shirt and tie guy too when I went to work, and now I look like this. For casual bowlers, the game was the end of the search. For many, there was more. But one man made it his life. They called him Mr. Duckpin, the wizard, the greatest duckpin bowler to ever live. Nick Tronsky. On December 15, 1910, in the small coal mining town of Minersville, Pennsylvania, Nicholas Tronsky, Duckpin Bowling's beloved son, was born. Along with his eight siblings, he was orphaned in 1924 when his parents both died suddenly from influenza. It was then that Nick moved to New Britain, Connecticut and discovered Duckpin Bowling. Tronsky got a start as a pin boy, setting strings for leagues and high roller pot games at the local alleys. But a lot of your good duck pin bowlers were pin boys at one time. And it's like golfers or caddies used to be, uh, and they came on being common good golfers. When I first went to work, the depression was on, so I, uh, I left high school in one year to help the family out. I got into, the, into, into setting up pins to make some money. Uh, I, because we only got like three and a half, four cents a line back then. So I used to go downtown with a quarter, get change for it, jingle in my pocket. I used to have about a dozen kids around me. I think I had a lot of money. <laughs> and as the nickels and dimes went down the lane, that was his night's pay and out the back door. He, basically, you never saw him. These pin boys were a galvanized lot. Life was hard, and bowling was inevitably immune to labor laws and civil litigation. No, oh, that was tough. Once you got into the pit, uh, you were told to pick up at least two pins at a time. As you became experienced in it, you could pick up three pins in each hand, put them in between your fingers, set them up on the pin deck. We tried to race each other, and the pin boys, and we could set them pins up and within 10 or 12 seconds. Some of the bowers did heckle the pin boys were not fast enough or were not taking care of the dead wood or something. So we, in turn, would uh, set up more than 10 pins. I think sometimes we try to get 13 pins up there. We would put a, a spare pin between the one and the five pin. But the toughest part of it was trying not to get hit by the pins and the flying ducks. And some of them fly pretty good. You know, he had a tough job. There's some of the guys, even back in the 50s and 60s, I mean, they, they get it down the lane pretty quick. Did you ever get hit? Oh, yeah. Not in the head, though. I still have it. But Nick Tronsky, even as a pin boy, had more to worry about than flying ducks. The brash and volatile duck pin pro Jack White had arranged a high-stakes match late one night in New Britain when suddenly he lost his bowling partner to a blown knee. In a pinch, White asked the 16-year-old Nick Tronsky, a pin boy, to fill in.
They won the match, and Jack White took Tronsky under his wing. Before his 21st birthday, he was named the number one male duck pin bowler in the nation. He would go on to win that honor four more times in his pro career, a career that spanned four decades, winning his last crown in 1962 at the age of 51. Up in, up in my, my little, little brain, I, I always said, well, I'd like to be a number one bowler like Nick Trosky because he was my idol when I was growing up. And he was perfection. To do the things he did with that duck pin bowl was amazing. I bowled with Nick Trotsky in tournaments. He was the Babe Ruth of duck pin bowling. When you walked into a tournament, you didn't ask what the score was. You asked what Trotsky hit. That's how good he was. He was so good, in fact, that he was hired by renowned aircraft propeller manufacturer Hamilton Standard to help the company bowling team. He worked there as a foreman for 37 years. His team won 29 industry league titles. But unlike the babe, Tronsky was a man of few words. The Gary Cooper type. Stolen, complex, like a lighthouse keeper or a Hemingway protagonist. He was quiet. Talk to him, he'd talk to you, but he'd go by you and not even say hello to you, maybe. But he'd get up on the lane so cool and collected, and he'd throw down, and if he dropped a strike or he went through the middle for two, he had the same look. Look straight there. He looked straight there. I don't know if he ever saw a ball hit the pin. You wouldn't know if he had an 88 game or a 188 game. He was always the same temperament, same look on his face. He may never have come out and said it, but Nick Tronsky lived to bowl. It was once estimated that he rolled over 500,000 games in his lifetime. And in 2000, he was named Bowler of the Century by the National Duck Pin Bowling Congress. He died in 1989 of lung cancer, but you could find him on the hardwood or around the alleys right up until the end. Nick Tronsky loved the country, too. He had a cottage in Rhode Island where he'd often visit alone to fish. It was a modest home, and at its threshold was its name, signed in a piece of driftwood, the duck pinner. On January 1st, 1953, the seemingly unchanging sport of bowling changed forever. The industrial revolution of a sport characterized by raw and rugged sentiments and battered pin boys was imminent. And of course, this age of bowling enlightenment had its Newtonian genius, Kenneth C. Sherman inventor of the world's first automatic pin setter. They came up with a state law in Massachusetts that saying that you had to be uh, 18 years old in order to set up pins at night because the leagues were running real late. Well, I really believe in that time there, they put their heads together and they said, they, we better do something about it. And they invented the, uh, the automatic machine. The Sherman pin setter was one of the most complex inventions of its time. It's 1,100 greasy, temperamental moving parts syncopate an eternal cycle of duck pin splendor. Established in 1954, the Woodlawn Bowling Center in West Haven, Connecticut was one of the first houses in America to open its doors, fully furnished with Sherman pin setters. 
One Woodlawn lifer has been chasing Mr. Sherman for nearly 40 years. Enter the twilight zone. You know, I was probably 10 years old when I started hanging around here. My mother caught me one day, dragged me out by the ear, and I uh, said, I don't want you hanging around there. Bob's an interesting guy. He is um, he's a fixture here at Woodlawn. I mean, everybody knows Bob Boucher. He knows how to fix everything. There's nothing that uh, he's ever said, oh, I don't know what to do with that. This is my kingdom. This, this is it. You know, many parts of my life have changed and come and gone, but this has remained the constant. I, I look at things that have been running for literally 50 years without wearing out, and they just they pound it day in and day out, and they still just keep running. Ken Sherman passed away in 1991, and not a single die cast fitting, not a gasket, not a bushing has been manufactured for his machine since 1973. They haven't made those machines for 30 years. That's why, with the foresight of fellow members before me, when the other centers, when they shut down, we bought their equipment. We store it. So now we have spare parts. Yeah, we, we become scavengers when it comes to, you know, getting parts from centers that have closed down. They're very patient, these machines. They'll wait 30 years for you to make a mistake. And when you do, they're right there to bite. There's nothing more important than having somebody that knows quick fixes when you don't have another part to, uh, to put on. You know, if you fashion little devices to, to help yourself. You can duct tape it and electrical tie it. And it looks horrible. It looks, you know, like a Frankenstein monster. It's just stitched with shoelaces and not a very neat manner. And this machine is just amazing at the, the slop it can have in it, and, st and it still operates. Sherman pin setters are truly indestructible machines, built to face the test of time. As persistent as the duck pin bowlers who've been beating on them for the past 50 years. It's just a conglomeration of state-of-the-art 1940s technology. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's really hard to, to sit here and tell you uh, how it works. There's uh, 17 uh, cams which means in these 17 micro switches that operate these cams. It's a system of electronic controls with cams, chains, belts, and micro switches. The only thing more complex than the machine's nuts and bolts is its impact, both advantageous and adverse to the growth of duck pins. The state of today's game hinges upon the puzzling genius and pride of Ken Sherman. Wow, the curse of Ken Sherman. Is it a curse? Without him, I don't know that the game would even exist. Um, and I guess because of him, it was stymied as far as limited growth. Mr. Sherman, he, he was a fool back then. I do know stories uh, that happened that the Brunswick people wanted to buy his patent out. Brunswick met with Mr. Sherman and, and made him an offer. And, and I don't know the numbers, but, but back in the 50s, it was a pretty good-sized number. And unfortunately, at that point in time, he felt that he could handle all the production that he needed, and he was going to be able to do it himself. I think Mr. Sherman at the time had, had no idea of the magnitude of where this could have gone. I think it just became such a part of him, he didn't want to give it up. Like, he, you know, it was his baby, and he wasn't going to let a big corporation take it over. If he would have sold his patent to Brunswick, they would have spread our game. Our game would have moved probably clear to the West Coast. When Mr. Sherman didn't get involved with Brunswick, they created the 10 pin machine. So now you have 10 pins in 50 states and duck pins in five or six. I actually got a chance to meet him one time. He, uh, I was working at a different bowling alley out in Hamden and just out of the blue one afternoon walked Ken Sherman, the inventor of this 
you know, thing that has pretty much been involved in my life one way or another for all this time. He had his son with him, he was bringing him on a tour of uh, Duck Pen Alley's that he had installed personally. And it was right near the end of his life. And, uh, you know, I got to shake his hand. That was like a big thrill for me. Ken Sherman had a dream that it was going to go further, maybe go to the Mississippi River. It was going to go up and down the East Coast and maybe nationwide. Had Mr. Sherman done this, I think uh, that Brunswick would have not designed a 10-pin machine, or maybe both. And if I offered you as a businessman duck pins or 10-pins, and, and you see the four-year-olds that can bowl duck pins, what age can you start bowling 10 pins? I don't know, they've made six pound balls. Uh, my personal opinion, and a man said one time, if you make a child that's four or five years old take that six pound ball up to that foul line, it should be called child abuse. You know, so 10 pins would have had a tough way to go. But uh, because of the big size of the corporation of Brunswick and the ability to promote and push it, they're where they're at today. And we're where we're at today. And we're still a bunch of happy duck pin bowlers. Oh, Jack! Roll that ball! Smash those pins! It's so much fun, it's so much fun! Let's do it again! Damn! Fairlane celebrates 60 years in duck pin bowling, so bow up the bargains in a Fairlane's fall winter duck I think the best lesson you can get from duck pin, and perhaps not like 10 pin, although none of us are perfect at 10 pin, but is, is the constant striving to, to improve your game to be better. Uh, and with, with duck pin, it's, it's a limitless, uh, you, you know, there's, there's no end in sight. You, you can strive and strive and, because nobody's reached perfection. Uh, you know, like a pitcher uh, wanting to have a zero ERA or a batter wanting to have a thousand uh, uh, batting average, you, you'll, you really will make the Guinness World Book of Records if you ever hit a perfect game because nobody's done it. Duck pins, there's never been a 300 game. And as far as I'm concerned, there probably will never be one. I don't think it'll, in a lifetime, it'll ever be done. It'll never happen. I don't, I don't believe it'll ever happen. Because all it takes is one bad ball. There are too many ways not to get a strike. And you need strikes to roll a perfect game. But you need to make your spares. You need to cover all your bases, throw the ball consistent. You're not just there to get strikes. Strikes are a bonus. You hit that pocket perfectly 10 times, chances are you're going to end up with four or five strikes at best. 10-pin bowling has seen its share of strikes. More than 56,000 perfect games were rolled in 2006 alone. That's enough to ruffle the feathers of any duck pinner. It is empirically unfeasible to achieve that kind of success in duck pins. In fact, you're probably more likely to get shot by a man-eating jackrabbit in the Mojave Desert. I have. I've, I've shot rabbits out in the Mojave Desert hunting for uh, coyotes. But a 300, it's as legendary as the Holy Grail. That's 12 consecutive strikes, 12 dead-on pocket hits, not one pin left standing. Four strikes in a row, or is a, it's a huge thing. Five strikes in a row, or like, wow, people are going to stop and watch. Six strikes in a row. But you're talking six strikes in a row being inducted is a remarkable start, and you're only halfway there. I think the part of the game is that you can be perfect, but because of the difference in the pin action and the, the turns on the ball that we can't measure, the difference in the lane, it may not turn out perfect. Let's see, I started bowling in 1969. Can't believe it's been that long. <laughs> My very first game was a 23. I remember that. <laughs> The most pins I ever knocked down on the first ball was five. <laughs> My high game, uh, I bowled it over here on lane seven and eight. I bowled 224. And that's the highest I've ever seen. Uh, my high game is 262. 243. 241. 247. 214. Lifetime, probably 187. Highest game ever thrown, 236. Only 236. I hold the world record, which was a 279, which I bowled 
on, uh, I believe it was March 5th, 1992, uh, Tebow Lanes in Newington. Pete Signore, uh, who is our world record holder, had one great and somewhat lucky night and shot 279. That's been the world's record for 12 years, and I, as far as I'm concerned, that'll be the world's record forever. I was using my ex-wife's bowling balls and decided to switch balls. I proceeded to throw nine strikes in a row and uh, nine drop, and it was like, you know, <laughs> it was amazing. I think if somebody gets six, seven in a row out the gate, mentally, you have to be a rock. If you sit down with a pencil and paper and do strikes and spares, look how hard it is to shoot a 280. It's tough. After I threw the eighth strike, I made the mistake of turning around and looking and seeing like how many people were watching me bowl, and I got a little nervous, and I said, well, I'm not going to turn around and watch. I was the only one bowling, I think, in the whole house. You know, you could hear a pin drop. After the 279 game, Pete started getting recognized at bowling centers throughout the state of Connecticut. He gets teased now and then about his celebrity status. At Woodlawn, he gets his black coffee and Twizzlers for free. Oh, I'm very, I'm a very superstitious bowler. I mean, uh, one night after, after bowling really bad at the tee bowl, I was so angry at myself for bowling. I had such a tough night that on the way home, I threw the ball in this farmer's field and the next day I went to go look for it, couldn't find it. So it's one of the balls I used for the 279, but I still have one left. But despite the hopeless shadow 300 casts on duck pin bowlers, there's still something poetic something beautiful about their struggle. I don't know if I want to see it. I really don't know if I want to see a perfect game. Even if it were me. Even if it were me. Of all the hundreds of millions of games that have been bowled, you would never be the same if you could bowl a perfect game in duck pens. I hope I'm there if it ever happens. The remarkable thing about duck pin bowling is that it's not just a sport. For many people, it's everything. There's been two weddings here inside the Woodlawn. There was a wedding here. Um, my sister, as a matter of fact, Laurie. And it was probably one of the nicest weddings I've ever attended. But I'd never tell her that. Yes. <laughs> and eight people have uh, left this world for the the bowling alley in heaven. A gentleman by the name of Mario Lupoli, I'll never forget Mario, he was like 110 average. We were bowling him on lane seven and eight. The first game he bowled 182. The second game he bowled 171. And he got up for the third game and on, he threw down on alley eight and he threw a strike for, in the first frame. I was sitting right on the bench in back of seven next time he came up. And he threw down on alley seven and he left a 9-10 split. I remember it like it was yesterday. He picked up the ball, he went back on the approach, and I was sitting directly behind him. Just fell right back, right into my lap. He was gone. But there's never been a birth in the Woodlawn. And I've had a couple of uh, very expecting mothers here, and I've begged and pleaded with them to, you know, have a seat on the couch and, you know, see what we can do about having a birth here, but it has yet to happen. My father owns a bowling alley, and uh, I was three years old when I started bowling. I identify myself as a bowler, and that's what everything's connected to. You know, people ask you what you do and what you like to do. My first thing would be to say that I'm a duck and bowler. I have one bowling ball that I've had probably since I was about 10 years old, and it's got all my world records in it. Like, it's bowled every single world record that I've had, so if, if I lost that ball, I'd probably freak out. If there was one thing, if my car got stolen or, or something, just please leave the bowling balls. A 28-year-old special education teacher and softball coach, Amy Bisson has become the face of duck pin bowling. She carries an unthinkable average of 151, has eight pro tour victories, and has been the number one ranked female bowler the last five years. Amy Bisson is one unbelievable bowler. It's just unbelievable. She could beat, I think, anybody you throw at her. She's like a machine. I mean, she just keeps rewriting the record book. We once had a combined tour 
where the women were in the same bowling establishment as the men. And, and in the eight-game qualifier, the, the women bowl eight games, the men bowl eight games. She beat us all. She beat us all. She's our Tiger Woods, really. Amy is, is our Tiger Woods. It's been a good ride so far. I think that um, I've been blessed with a talent that I'm not really sure. It's, it's really hard to explain, you know, how it, how it all happened and, and why, you know, you know, people ask all the time, you know, how are you so good or, you know, what do you do? You know, do you practice all the time? And it's kind of like, I don't know, God, God just, you know, chose me to, uh, to be able to duck and bowl. <laughs>duck pins are a big part of my life, my whole life. And we know that nothing stays the same. Nothing stays the same. And if you're not growing and you can't stay the same, the bottom line is you're going to shrink. By 1970, there were hundreds of duck pin bowling centers throughout the eastern seaboard. Today, only 58 remain. You know, there hasn't been anybody opening up a new duck pin lane in 30 plus years. Some of the old proprietors are tired and they don't want to uh, run it anymore. The kids don't want it, so they sell it and they take their lanes out and tear the whole building down just for the location. And when you're bowling and paying three and a half to five dollars a game and you're taking a thousand square feet per lane, I mean, all of a sudden somebody walks up and offers that, you know, it's like, wow. Why can't you turn that down? Duck pin bowing or ten pin or bowing period will never be the same as it was back in the 50s and 60s and middle 70s. Ten, 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 ten. Shakes that ten. Picks up nine pin. Nine pins and a big grin on that. Ten pin was shaking more than Frank was on that frame. Some good-natured booing, if that's possible. There's no more tournaments, no more open tournaments. We used to have one every month. We used to have Airway 32. We used to have Airway 20. Bowler Drum. Bowler Drum. Darlington. Town Hall. Hamlet. There's no more tournaments. Back in the 1960s, there were probably about 25,000 or more sanctioned bowlers. Um, nowadays, we have about 7,500. But my question is, where did those bowlers go? I want to know where they went. They, they, uh, the lanes closed, and where did all the bowlers go? There were thousands of bowlers. Where did they all go? I don't know where they are. Society has changed the game a lot. Two people working, that wasn't the case in, back in the 50s and 60s. Mom stayed home, raised the kids. They were buying bigger homes and spending more money, and uh, those people were working. So it's a little tougher to to get out in the evening. I don't think people have the social lives that, that say I had, you know, or had the time to have. Maybe Americans are just, have just become addicted to their television sets. Um, it, it, just witness what happens to any child in a household where there's a TV and no supervision. It, it, children left to their own in a house with a TV that they have access to are probably going to sit down and watch it. Kids are uh, becoming couch potatoes. They're not really uh, getting out and moving their body around. You know, we'd leave our house in the morning, kiss our mom goodbye, and then we had to be home for dinner. Um, you know, kids found something to do. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have video games. We went out and we played. And if the weather was bad, we came inside. And one of the very few places that you can go inside was Woodlawn Duck Pin Bowling. Duck Pin Bowling, where is it? There's still centers in Virginia. There's still centers in the Washington, D.C. area. Obviously, Baltimore. Um, Massachusetts still has some Duck Pin Centers. Rhode Island has Duck Pin Centers. Um, Connecticut. I would not want to be the last bowling center, the last duck pin bowling center. Mm. I wouldn't want to go through it. I wouldn't want to go through it. I had a fire in 1978. Whew. Devastating. And I guess 
eight, 10, 12 days went by and I was there every day watching the work in progress. And one day I went over and no one was there. I couldn't stay. Pretty tough, pretty tough. There will always be duck pin bowling. There won't be one on every corner like it used to be. But it'll never be dead. I'll put it that way. Good things don't come easy, and no one knows that better than a duck pin bowler. And from Tronsky to Bisson, the perfect game to the pin setter, duck pin bowling will never die. When you roll duck pin, you got to take the, the chops and the splits with the spares and the strikes. It's the history. It's there. You've got to keep the spirit alive. This game gets in your blood. I lived and breathed for many, many years. It's just part of my life. And I just fell in love with Duckman. I just, I just love I it. I have 80% arthritis. I got it in my neck. I got it in my, my spine, my hips. Got a handicap sticker. What I take for it? Duck pin bowl. Nothing else. Hey, let me tell you, you want to play duck pins? Hey, it's the only way to do it. You throw these little balls, you hit these little pins, and they all go over the place. 